there, and thank you so much for joining us today. You are listening to Society Bites Radio, social interaction for the mind and soul. It is part of the Radio Ear Network family. I am your host, Sue Ashby, and this is Over the Edge. This program deals with adult issues, and parental discretion is advised, as some of the items in this show are not suitable for young children. Today, my guest is Jennifer Tracy, who has an absolutely fascinating life facing numerous challenges and, what is more important, learning to overcome those challenges and do good for other people. Jennifer, welcome to my show. It's a great honor to have you with me. I look forward to learning more about you. Hi, Sue. How are you? I'm very, very well, thank you. Hey. So tell me a little bit before we go into the wonderful work that you're doing, a little bit about your story. Bear in mind, this is a two-part show. This is part one. So um, we'll do the story and a little bit about what you're doing. And the second one, we'll do uh, a little bit of your story, just a brief outline, and then go into the real work that you're doing to help other people face the challenges that they face. Well, Sue, I have quite the story, so uh, that's kind of an open-ended uh, tell about the story, but how about I talk about um, maybe at least just the last 10, 15 years. So uh, 15 years ago, sadly, uh, my family set off to get some school supplies, and about 10 minutes down the road where they were traveling, a drunk driver blew through a stop sign and killed my husband and one of my twin daughters instantly. Um, In that, in that moment, uh, my other twin daughter, Michaela was given a 20% chance to live. They flight for life her. Uh, She was left completely paralyzed on the right side of her face and death in her right ear. Uh, My younger daughter, Amber, also survived, and she had what they called inner contusions, so most of her injuries were internal. Uh, That's, can't, I can hardly believe that that was 15 years ago. So my oldest daughter now is 24, and my youngest daughter is 21. Um, But more importantly than just that specific day, Um, after my husband and daughter were killed, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And for whatever reason, I realized that that good old analogy when you're flying on the airplane where they say, in the event that you're flying with a child, that you should put the oxygen mask on yourself first. And I just, I don't know why that has stuck with me so vividly, Sue, that if I really did want to save my daughters, I had to save myself first. And so, you know, sometimes when people go through trauma or traumatic events, like right away they launch nonprofits or they write a book or they kind of bury themselves in like a greater work. Mm -hmm. But uh, on purpose, I, I really kind of shunned away from all of that. I didn't do TV interviews or write a book or start a nonprofit or anything. I really tried to hunker down and take care of myself and my daughters. And so it was about five or six years after they died, I started speaking. Okay. I have a question just before you go on. Your PTSD diagnosis, was that because of the accident or was that that just related to prior stuff? So that's what's so interesting is like that's kind of what really inspired me to write my book and my programs and stuff is that my PTSD diagnosis actually came out of um, some therapy that I was doing because I was already really struggling and um, had been suicidal and had been in the psychiatric unit. And so, yeah, if you can imagine kind of already having lived through a bunch of trauma and then my husband and daughter were killed. 
So it's like the, the that's PC... like the ultimate blow, you know, isn't it? It's 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 unimaginable that after going through a lot of hard things, you then get whacked again. I did, and um, again, you know, most people think, "Wow, if you were already struggling and already." suicidal and all of these things how in the world did you pull yourself up you know after your husband and daughter were killed but um it's really interesting Sue because a lot of times there's just this really strange like stigma um when it comes to like being depressed or being suicidal and so like I told you, that's really what inspired me to write my book, Inside the Mind of Suicide, because every time I would speak and share with my audience that I had to battle through PTSD and suicide to be this woman in front of them, most people always assumed that my battle with suicide came after my husband and daughter were killed. Right. But it didn't. It absolutely did not. And. So yeah, so that's kind of the kind of the um, you know quick version of like 15 years. What happened? Like I said, I spent a good chunk of those years really taking care of myself. I went to therapy almost every week uh, for three or four years. I did something called EMDR, which is a great technique that I advocate for a lot. Uh, for people who have PTSD, what honestly, does it stand I would say. For? E what does that stand for? Do you know? I do. EMDR is Eye Movement Desensitation Reprocessing. I'm not sure. I, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a hard one to say, um, but you know, for anyone that's listening, you know, sometimes just therapy alone is like not enough or, you know, medication is not enough or just praying is not enough. Um, EMDR is, I, I am amazed that more people don't know of it. And I'm also amazed that more therapists aren't trained in it and don't recognize the power that it has um, to really help people with deep trauma. I, I, I would not be the woman that I am today if I had not done EMDR. And it's not a taboo thing. Like if anyone that's listening is like, oh, what in the world is EMDR? Um, it's just a, it's a type of therapy where you recall the traumatic event. And while you do that, you force your brain to either tap, follow a finger, follow a light, or um, to listen to like a beeping noise. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it makes your brain like forcibly think about, talk about the trauma while you're also trying to do this other thing. And so it breaks up this, I call it kind of like a file that's like stored in your brain. It's like a full on disc mm. <laughs> that, can, that, can, that can just kind of take you out. And the EMDR really breaks that up. And so, yeah, uh, that's one of the things that I did early on after my husband and daughter were killed. And since then, you know, I've had traumatic brain surgery. My mom died. Um, and whenever those things just take me to my knees, I know that I need to get back in and do some work and do some EMDR. That's an incredible tool to have in your toolbox to use, hopefully not too much more, but whenever you need it or whenever you <laughs> feel you need it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, my favorite thing is just really introducing people to it today. And um, there's lots of stuff out there, but um, I know that you and I will get into you know, kind of what I'm doing today, but that's a huge component of the nonprofit piece that I'm doing now is just, again, like I said, bringing awareness to the resources that are out there so that people don't have to live the rest of their lives feeling so stuck and stuck in the trauma. 
Absolutely. And it's so good that we, you know, that's a non-medical, a non-pharmaceutical solution to oh, yeah. these things. Because normally when you go to see somebody, they go, here's some pills. And the, the pills don't, they may numb things, but they don't help solve the problem because the problem isn't going to go away. It just has to be handled in a different way. Yeah, it's so interesting that you bring up the topic of pills and medication. And um, again, I just I'm so passionate about it because I feel like there is just not a black and white solution when it comes to medication. Um, And so I'm very, very passionate about whenever I'm working with people that we truly evaluate for that person where they're at, what they've tried. You know, do they have medical conditions? Because all of those things really need to be taken into consideration when it comes to medication. Mm-hmm. Um, so for myself, being completely honest, and again, for anyone that's listening, um, when my husband and daughter were first killed and I was first diagnosed with PTSD, I was on quite a bit of medication and I hated it. I was so resistant to having to, to take it, but the truth is, Sue, that uh, when I didn't take the medication, I was under so much stress that I would have such severe nosebleeds that I would have to go to the emergency room and have my nose cauterized just to get it to stop bleeding. Wow. And so, so I, again, I'm not you know, saying that I want everyone to go around taking medication because, um, you know, it's it'll only band-aid if you don't also do internal work and move through some of the things that you're going through. But I definitely feel like there is a time and a place for medication. So I worked myself off of those medications. Um, You know, I'm no longer on all of those things that I was on, Mm -hmm. but, but for some people, you know, if they have to take medication, uh, you know, there's no judgment from me in that. Um, again, it's just, it's not a black and white solution. Everyone That's, has to really kind of evaluate for themselves. Everybody's case is different, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody is an in, a true individual in how they cope with whatever life challenges get thrown at them throughout their life. Yep. I, yeah, Absolutely. Can I ask you what took you to such an extreme point of depression that suicide even became an option in your mind? Yeah, Sue, that is, again, that is really the story of where this all started. So I was a young mom. I was 24. I had three little girls. And sadly, I had to have a hysterectomy. I just could not, I could not get my female parts to work. I had gone a year and it just, um, so I had to have a medically induced hysterectomy at 24 and they took out my ovaries. And for anyone that knows anything about that, um, that's just not a good situation to find yourself in, you know, where they take that hormone Mm. out of, of your, out of your body. But here's what happened to me. Um, You're talking to a go-getter graduated a year early from high school, had my cosmetology license at 17, opened my own hair salon, owned my own home. I mean, you, again, even though I've been through a lot of stuff as a young child, I was just a go-getter. Um, but at 24, after the hysterectomy, I started feeling depressed. Um, I noticed I just didn't feel myself. I I didn't want to do things. I was, I was withdrawn. I didn't go to the typical events that I would. Um, And so I went in and talked to my doctor and he made me kind of do this like intake form to see if I had depression. And this was all new for me. You know, I talk about it now as if 